Let's talk about price controls. So here we have our jam example, and we might wonder, well, what would happen if the government said, hey, jam's really important, uh, we want everyone to have as much jam as they want, uh, jam is a necessity, so we're going to create a price ceiling. Now think about what the ceiling does. It stops you from going up higher, if you can jump really high. Then the ceiling would stop you from going up higher, and that's what a price ceiling does. So here, let's put in a ceiling, say at $1.50, and here I'm going to label that as a C. That means that we can't go up from there. So what we want to figure out is the amount supplied and the amount demanded. Um, here I'm just going to make up numbers, but uh, it can really be anything that makes sense. Right here, we have our quantity supplied. It's larger than 2, it's less than 10, I'm going to call it 3. Then we have our quantity demanded. Less than 25, larger than 10, I'm going to call it 17. And so this is our quantity demanded. Notice what happens. The price had been $3, the government forces it down. At a lower price, more people want to buy jam, because why not, right? You've got your pancakes, you can throw all kinds of different jam on it, because now the jam's less expensive. So our quantity demanded increases. We move along the demand curve. What about for the suppliers? Well, I was getting $3 for making jam, and now I only get $1.50. So it could be that it's no longer worth it for me to make jam, so when you get out of the business, some people may remain, and here we see that three jars of jam are produced. What we end up with is uh, what we call a shortage. So here, the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. I wouldn't work on memorizing that. Um, you know, think about what happens if you go to the supermarket. There's 17 people that want to buy jam. There's only three jars on the shelf. Right? That means that we have 14 people Right, or 14 jars of jam of shortage, which is people want to buy it, they're willing and able to pay the price, but it's just not there. So this is a shortage, and this happens when we use a price control that stops uh, the price from rising. Notice what would happen. We have some producers who, um, yeah, say we're at the, the jam black market, um, maybe an unregulated farmer's market, and you know, well, what about it at $2? So at $2, lots of people still want to buy the jam. But importantly, a few more producers would be willing to produce at that price. And so these producers would be happy to, uh, to sell it for that price. The consumers who originally bought the jam at $1.50 are happy. The other consumers are really unhappy because they really enjoyed the jam. They're willing to pay, um, you know, for here, these, these guys are willing to pay up to $3 for it. Um, so uh, lots of people are willing to pay two. So in this case, the price would tend to naturally rise. There's what we call upward pressure on prices, which is that people would be happy to make an offer to uh, a jam producer and say, hey, you know, if you've got some of that jam, I'll give you $2 for it. Just don't tell the government. Um, probably someone would be willing to pay two fifty, and all the way up until we get to this point, equilibrium, which is three dollars. At that point, anyone who's willing to pay three dollars for it, that's everybody on this side of that point, everybody over here is willing to pay three dollars or more. So at that point, all those people have paid, uh, can pay three dollars and get their jam. If the price goes lower than that, then the quantity sold is whatever is being supplied. If there's only three jars of jam on the shelf, only three jars can be sold. So the quantity sold, in this case, is the quantity supplied, which is the lesser of quantity supplied and quantity demanded. What if we were to uh, impose a price floor? So maybe the government comes in and says, hey, you know, we really care about jam producers. We want them to do better. So let's see what that would look like. Again, we have some supply and demand curves. 
we've got an equilibrium here at three dollars ten units not drawn to scale um, and we impose a price ceiling or sorry a price floor right here at five dollars now that price floor stops the price from going lower right so a floor stops you from going lower so in this case we can find our quantity demanded that's going to be on the left this time because we're following our demand curve to where it meets the price floor so now everyone to the left of this point values jam at at least five dollars well, let's say that this is six people we know that it's less than ten more than zero um, so this is our quantity demanded what about our quantity supplied well, at a high price of $5, they're really excited to supply it. Uh, we know that it's less than 25. Let's call it 16. So here we have a difference between our quantity demanded and our quantity supplied of 10. So before we called it a shortage when there wasn't enough to meet demand. Now when there aren't enough consumers uh, to meet the suppliers, that means that we have a surplus, there's extra. So you go to the store, and there's a bunch of jam sitting on the shelf for $5, but people aren't willing to pay um, that much for it. These people are, but not the rest of them. So in this case, we end up with a surplus of jam of 10 units. Um, so if you're a supplier, and you see that there's a floor of $5, that means that you, you can't possibly sell it for less than 5 um, you're really happy and you're like, oh good, I'm going to make lots of jam. But then you find out that at $5, people don't want to buy nearly as much. So you have jam sitting on the shelf. That's not so good for you because it doesn't make you money. You can't sell it for less, but it doesn't mean that you're able to sell everything that you want. So here there's downward pressure on prices, which is, you know, you're at the store and you're like, man, you know, I, I only value my jam at $4. Um, I'd pay you four for it, I'm not going to pay you five. And the manager might be like, hey, you know, I've got some in the supplier room, I can hook you up, because otherwise it's just sitting here on the shelf and I can't get rid of it. So with, a, uh, with an effective price floor, um, there's downward pressure on wages. Now what if we had put a floor down here at two dollars? So here I'm going to label this as a floor. This means that we can't sell it for less than two. But prices want to go to three, so that's where they're, where they're heading to. The floor doesn't stop it from going to three. So it's like saying that you, know, you, you can't sell your laptop computer for $10. Sure, you weren't going to anyway. Um, so it's ineffective. Same thing can happen for a ceiling. Uh, you're not allowed to sell jam for more than $200 a jar. Well, unless it was some crazy good jam, that wasn't going to happen anyway. So a price floor and a price ceiling can be effective or ineffective. Um, and note that people will tend to try to go to a black market or try to find some way around the system because uh, buyers and sellers can both be better off by getting to the equilibrium.